Welcome to The On List. Today, I wanna to take you on a deep dive concerning a fragrance that, at least in my opinion, is one of, if not the quintessential representation of mid-century masculinity in perfume. It's a bit of a mouthful, so let me unpack that. The era directly after World War II, so let's say 1945, until about 1965, six or seven, right around the time that the Summer of Love started, Woodstock, the counterculture, all of that, hippies, okay? That roughly 20 to 22 year span was probably among the most conservative periods in Western history, particularly in Anglophone countries. So the United States, Great Britain, conservatism basically ruled the day. Everything was styled so conservatively. Life was lived so conservatively. Maybe a little less so in the U.S. because the U.S. had its big finned cars and its other material excesses, okay? We had lots of chrome and neon lights and, you know, other things that are distinctly American, right? Idiosyncratically so. But beyond those things, at least as far as style was concerned for the individual, very, very conservative. And a lot of that can be traced back to the generation that was most prosperous during that 20 year period. These were what we refer to now as the greatest generation, the people who fought World War II. And they spent their early years in the military fighting a conflict that would go on to shape them for the rest of their lives. So it's unsurprising that a lot of that sort of Spartan, ascetic, stoic uh, style and mindset that was imbued in them from the military and their war experience would then carry on into their civilian life. So we're talking guys who wore very militaristic clothing, sloped shoulders, straight lines, okay? Uh, nothing that was terribly form-fitting, but also not baggy either. We're talking clean-shaven, can't have beards, can't have goatees, super short hair, sometimes slicked back, all right? The sort of stereotypical military propaganda, ubermensch kind of look, like the Clark Kent look, if we want to make a comic book reference here. That was how all guys more or less chose to live in the late 40s, the 50s, into the early 60s, with some notable exceptions. I mean, you had beatniks and stuff like that in the 50s, making some rounds. But by and large, people had that square jaw, clean shaven, you know, shoulders back, chest out, chin up kind of a mentality. No fuss, no muss, no frivolity. And honestly, a guy like that, who carries those very immaterial, militaristic values into civilian life, that is a very difficult guy to try and sell luxury items because that's a guy who doesn't really want for those luxury items. You know, he, as long as he has his car, his house, his loving wife, his kids, you know, a TV in front of him, food on his plate, maybe a hobby like bowling or something that was popular in the 50s, that's really it. Really kind of wanted for nothing. So what do you do? How do you pitch something as uh, superfluous as you know, a designer fragrance to a guy like that. He could make do with his aqua velva. He could make do with his skin bracer. He could make do with whatever he had at hand. So if you lived in the UK, there were different brands. If you lived in France, there were different brands. You know, but that basic utilitarian stuff was all he really needed. You know, his bowl, his brush, his razor blade. Didn't want anything fancy. How do you sell a fragrance to a guy like that? Well, the answer is to basically look at what he was already using, what he was already enjoying, and try to make a more refined version of it. So in a lot of cases, that meant the very, very most basic scent profile that men in that era enjoyed, which would be something based around an aftershave, okay, maybe a, a true eau de cologne splash like 4711, make a fragrance styled like that. And we would see answers come in the form of you know, Pinot Silvestri, Aqua de Selva in Italy, okay. We would see in America, Revlon, Avon, Elizabeth Arden all come out with very sort of uh, undecorated, non-floral, non-spicy, non-sweet, just very 
strict citrus and woods profile fragrances. Maybe a little bit of tobacco in there because guys like the smell of tobacco back then, but that was it. No fuss, no muss. Designers, well, you know, designers are all about being elevated, being above the din, right? So an excessive amount of refinement was worked into most designer fragrances from this period. You would see things like uh, Moustache by Rochas in 49. You would see things like uh, Paul Monsieur by Chanel in 55. But the reason why I pick this fragrance, Monsieur de Givenchy, as the quintessential example of that style is it brings all of the elements together in such a almost excruciatingly balanced format. Like we're talking about someone who is so trying to stay down the straight and narrow, almost painfully so, walking on eggshells, you know, really, really trying his hardest to make a fragrance that is so even keeled, so uh, straight down the middle, that the effort to do that alone is what really resonates in this fragrance. You know, other fragrances go a little bit more floral, a little bit more mossy, you know, maybe uh, a little more citrus, a little more musk, okay? This fragrance doesn't go a little more in any direction. It is so perfectly even keeled and balanced that you sometimes forget how much effort went into this fragrance, despite it being so simple, so light. We will discuss why it is light in a second, but first let's talk about the actual composition itself and its perfumer. So Fabrice Fabron made Monsieur de Givenchy and it released in 1959. Now I know some of you are going to say, but hey, wait a minute, what about Monsieur Lanvin in 64? What about Eau Sauvage in 66? Are they not more important fragrances, especially Eau Sauvage? Is that not a more important fragrance for the mid-century vibe? And I want to say no, because as important as Eau Sauvage was overall to the history of perfume, because it was the first use of Hedion in a fragrance, okay? It was a very big watershed fragrance for all the perfume industry. But when it first came out in 1966, it was daringly different because of its scent profile. A lot of women actually enjoyed wearing it too. It was a sort of a cultural phenomenon, if you will. But in the strict purview of masculine fragrances, no. Eau Sauvage was a massive deviation. It was a huge deviation. Monsieur Lanvin was also a bit of a deviation because it was very floral and had lots of civet in it. So it was a very sour, uranus fragrance with a high floral quotient. That was not straight and narrow, okay? Thus, I say, of all the mid-century masculine fragrances, Monsieur de Givenchy, in my opinion, is the most quintessential one. It is the best representation of the average taste. That's what I'm getting at here. It is the best, most perfect representation of the average taste in fragrance for men in the West in that mid-century period, that 20-year period from the late 40s to the late 60s. Now, Fabrice Fabron, as I mentioned, made this fragrance. He had also done basically everything else for Givenchy up until that point. So he did L'Entre-D, he did Lady, he did some things for Nina Ricci as well. L'Air du Tom was created by Fabrice Fabron, and you can almost consider Monsieur de Givenchy to somewhat be like a men's uh, L'Air du Tom because it does have a carnation note that is reminiscent of uh, L'Air du Tom in it. So if you've smelled L'Air du Tom by uh, Nina Ricci and you notice the carnation in that fragrance, the same carnation note turns up in Monsieur de Givenchy. Now, beyond that, it's a very, very simple scent. I mean, it is so simple that you wonder how it took uh, them so long to make it. You know, why it, it didn't come out until basically the end of the 50s. 59 is when it hit shelves. It's just lemon, bergamot. Uh, it's got some lavender. Obviously, it's got carnation in it. It's got a little bit of peppery notes, too. It's got a tiny bit of black pepper in it and a little bit of cinnamon. The cinnamon actually is so small, you can almost miss it, but it's used to smooth over the pepper so it doesn't have a bite. Like Blenna Bouquet with a lot of black pepper obviously has a lot of bite to it. This is a very mauled smooth, tiny, tiny, ever so slight bit of pepper. Like I said, blink and it's gone. Primarily, you get the citruses here, 
which are very smooth and rich because the carnation makes them rich. The lavender builds it out, makes it more familiar in its masculinity, rounder, okay? And then the base is really the star player in this fragrance. And this fragrance also relies very, very highly on the nobility of its materials. Typically, I'm not a material snob. I'm not a natural snob. I'm not an elitist. You know, I've done videos uh, speaking out against people like that. But everything has exceptions, correct? I myself say that there is no one uh, black and white absolute rule. Everything has exceptions. And in this case, Monsieur de Givenchy is a fragrance that kind of lives and dies by the quality of its naturals. Once you start subbing out those naturals, once you start replacing them, you run into problems because those naturals kind of carry the fragrance. In this case, Monsieur de Givenchy very much heavily relies on both oak moss and Mysore sandalwood. Yes, this is a sheep, so there is labdanum in here as well. Yes, there's a tiny bit of vanilla in here, okay. Ever so slight bit of tonka. All of these things are just used to further round the composition, remove the sharpness. This is not a tonka bomb. This is not a vanilla bomb. Get that out of your head, okay. This is definitely a sheep. The primary elements are going to be the citrus, the labdanum, the oak moss, the sandalwood, as a dictionary definition sheep is supposed to be. That is what this is. But a man's version, so no florals, no big heavy amber notes, none of that stuff. Not youth do, not sheep to Cody. This is very much a strict citrus aromatic sheep exercise of probably the most academic order, okay? The only sheep I can think of that's more academic than this is probably Capucci Porome from 67, which is right at the very tail end of this period anyway. Now, this is the quintessential man's fragrance from the mid-century because it is so round, it is so smooth, it is so light on its feet, so discreet. It creates this dapper, gentlemanly bubble that is both noticeable to you but easily tuned out. But it comes and it goes all throughout the day, okay? And it is the kind of fragrance that a person who walks past you, if they're not paying attention, they won't even know you're wearing a fragrance. But if they get close enough to you and they spend enough time in your airspace, breathing your air, they'll go, hey, you smell nice, right? That's the exact thing men wanted in the 50s, the 40s, the 50s, the early 60s. They did not want to fill a room when they entered it. They did not want their fragrance to announce them. They were kind of cautiously optimistic, but they were still on the fence about even wearing a fragrance at all, okay? So the last thing they want is their fragrance to get them undue attention. Because again, they walk softly and carry a big stick. They'd rather let their actions speak louder than their words. They are from that generation. That is how they are. The last thing they want is a foghorn, okay? Something like Sauvage would be antithetical to that generation of man. Something like Lamal would be antithetical to men from that generation. It is so funny how far we have come from this mentality that created this fragrance. This is almost an anti-fragrance. Monsieur de Givenchy is in some ways the anti-cologne for a lot of modern day men because it is the exact opposite of projection, sillage, performance, okay? It is not something that is reaching out and grabbing you and saying, give me compliments, notice me. This does not do that. This is not a fragrance designed to do that. This is a fragrance designed to be noticed only by people who are paying attention. If they're not paying attention to you, they won't notice this fragrance. And if you're not paying attention, you might stop noticing it too, but that is perfect. It is just the finishing touch to a grooming routine. You use the associated shaving products. You use the associating uh, hair products. That's it. You layer it all together. You're clean. You're structured. You're formed. Your shoulders are let down. And you're out the door to clock in eight more hours at the office or the factory or wherever it is you're going. Okay? That's the point. And this fragrance is probably the best example of that mentality that you will find. Now, let's talk about the different bottles. The original 1959 splash format 
Okay, I don't have a bottle from 59, but I have a bottle of that generation, that first bottle style, that first everything. So here it is. First, let me show you the bottle itself. This is what that first generation bottle looks like. And uh, you see it's very plain label. Like I said, antithetical to stuff like Lamal or One Million. This is as plain and austere as it gets, okay? And in the back just says the alcohol percentage, tells you the address of Givenchy, Parfum Givenchy, and that's it. That's all you get. And it's got a nice little Bakelite cap here. You unscrew the Bakelite cap, and guess what? You splash it on with your fingers. The hole is just big enough for your finger to cover the hole, and you do this, and you put it on, and that's it, you're done. You're out the door. No fuss, no muss, perfect. Now the box that this comes in is also pretty cool. You know, you may have noticed that, uh, that it has three and two thirds, three and two thirds ounce instead of 3.4. So it's so old it uses fractions, right? You haven't seen fractions used on a bottle like that in decades. So here's the box, you know, nothing doing. The, the cool like interlocking G logo. Now, Givenchy Gentleman, which would launch in 74, would have a box very similar to this, but, you know, silver in the middle. And this would be white, but otherwise, same box. So if you are someone who owns Givenchy Gentleman, you're familiar with this format box. Now, they did introduce sprays. The first sprays in the 70s were pressurized. Then the later sprays in the 80s were not pressurized, but they have the same bottle form factor. The difference is one has gas, one is obviously spring fed. These are those bottles. This is an 80s example. So the first time you could acquire this fragrance in a spray bottle was the 70s. This is an 80s example. This is not pressurized. This has got the natural spray plunger on it. And as you can see, basically the same thing, okay? Now it's three and one third though, so we lost a third somewhere. Between the original splash and this, we lost a third of juice. A third of an ounce, I guess. Back is the same thing, you know, 90% alcohol, nothing doing. So I do like how the cap, again, has that, uh, that logo. Now, things would remain basically unchanged through the 90s, all right? It wouldn't be until the early 2000s that we would see a major change in the packaging. And that change would look like this. As you can see, the bottle form factor stays the same, right? This is still a splash, but this is a much bigger 200 mil splash. However, the wraparound label is gone. And in its place, we will see the centered label. Now, bottles of Givenchy Gentlemen from this period also have this same centered label. However, this fragrance was formulated favorably in the early 2000s. It still smells very good and very true to the original. This is still a very, very good bottle. If you don't want to look for this and spend big money on it, and you also don't want to look for this and spend big money on it, this is definitely a next best thing. And when I say next best thing, I don't mean like it's only half as good, but it's better than nothing. I mean, this is extremely good. As far as I can tell, the only major difference between this and the old one is obviously the Mysore sandalwood is gone. So there is some synthetic sandalwood replacer in this now. And also uh, oak moss is toned down a touch because we're talking 2002, right? The first IFRA restriction on oak moss went into effect in 2001. So a little less oak moss. Some kind of synthetic sandalwood is now in the place of this. And also you'll notice the musk choice has changed. Now, I should have said that the musk choice actually changed between here and here because this bottle has detectable nitro musks in it. I've got vintage fragrances that contain stuff like musk, xylene and stuff in them, and I can smell that in this. This 80s bottle, I cannot. So the nitro musks were gone by the time this came out. You're only going to find the nitro musks in this bottle. By the time we get to this fragrance, the musk choice has changed again. And honestly, the big difference between this one and the previous two, it really just boils down to the, uh, the clarity of the citrus and the lavender. 
when I smell this one, I get much more of the citrus, of the lavender, of the carnation. So you get a bit more of a top note, mid note boost because like I said, the bass is toned down. Sandalwood has been replaced. Oak moss has been reduced. So this actually feels a bit brighter and a bit soapier. This is actually more sheeper-like, if you will. This is more sheeper-like. The older ones are definitely rounder, muskier, woodier, you know, more uh, traditionally masculine, if you will. But this 2000s bottle is very delightful, and I wear it a lot. Okay, this is good. So I've actually already put a, somewhat of a dent in this. This was filled to the top when I got it. Now it's about halfway down the collar. So I've been splashing this like crazy. I've been using a lot of this one. So this is not to be underestimated. Unfortunately, that's really the end of the line. The next reformulation would take the form of the so-called um, Le Mythiques bottles. And the Le Mythiques bottles are, in my opinion, trash, garbage. I brought it in for you to see but uh, I'm going to do nothing but talk bad about this. <laughs> this bottle right here is just hot trash. Now, I don't know if Fabrice Fabron was involved with the reformulations of the other versions, but I know whoever did this, they didn't care. They were like, you know what? This is an old fragrance. No one's gonna buy this. I don't care. So this has no oak moss, no sandalwood, and whatever they put, like, Whatever sandalwood replacer was in this bottle is not even in this bottle. It's something way worse and way cheaper. This fragrance is very sharp, very sharp, very harsh, okay? The citrus is not rounded. The lavender, I feel like, is not even present in this fragrance. They have some kind of synthetic thing. Clearly, the carnation is gone, too, because the eugenol got restricted alongside of everything else, clearly, right? So this, this is um, the proverbial shadow of its former self, right? Completely gutted. This just smells like citrus hand soap. Very sharp, very acrid, very linear citrus hand soap. A few tiny ticks or wisps of the original fragrance does peek through midway through. Once this has been on your skin for maybe like two hours, if you're able to tolerate it, okay, clearly. If you're able to tolerate it, after a couple hours, you get some skeletal resemblance to the other bottles, you know, the way the uh, lavender and the bergamot combine together with whatever they're using for labdanum, which is not real cystus labdanum anymore, whatever's in this, the chemicals that are in this. It kind of gives you a, like a, a, a fun house distorted mirror version, I guess, of those older fragrances. And you know, it's not unpleasant, I mean, I've smelled worse fragrances than this, but like this is literally like uh, you, you jump out of the shower, okay, you, you spray this on, and then after like an hour or two, you forget about it. Because this actually has, it's funny because this stuff has nuclear longevity on fabric. So if you go to sleep in this, your pillow is going to smell like this forever. But as far as it being on your skin, 30 minutes to an hour, you forget all about it. It's kind of sad, actually. It's the weirdest fragrance. It has this forever longevity on paper and fabric, but on a person, it just kind of disappears. So when I spray this and it's on my shirt, it becomes nagging. Like I'm detecting it all day and I'm getting sick of it. But when it's on my skin, like behind my ears, I lose sight of it in like an hour. Bizarre, can't explain it. There is also one newer bottle, which I don't have. The bottle that replaced this, okay, the most recent bottle. Uh, it's no longer called Monsieur de Givenchy. Now it's just Monsieur Givenchy. They took the day away. The DE is gone. I haven't smelled that. I can't really speak for it, but I highly doubt it's any better than that bottle. I highly doubt it. Okay, guys, this has been the Unlist. Really long video, but worth it. Now you know all about the fragrance and go out and enjoy. Thanks for watching.